right, welcome to another Brain Joe Bite. So as you know, this Brain Joe Bite series um, centers around how we can practice smarter when learning music, uh, specifically how we can organize practice time so that we fully uh, capitalize on the magical capabilities of the three pound organ that sits inside all of our skulls. But in order for all of that to matter it in the first place, we actually have to show up and practice, right? We actually have to be able to, or we actually have to be playing our instrument in order to progress. And for some, that can be challenging. Um, and that's because there are obstacles in most people's lives that stand in the way of practice time. And the two biggest ones are time and motivation. So number one, many people lead already busy lives with existing hobbies and commitments. So practicing regularly means finding a time to fit that into what already feels like a packed schedule. And then some people might not always feel the desire or motivation to practice. And that, uh, which I've discussed a good bit, stems from frustration, typically. Really frustration about a perceived lack of progress. Um, that's what really um, saps motivation. And many of the prior Brain Joe Bite episodes have been devoted to ways of minimizing frustration and uh, ensuring consistent progress, which is really what is our fuel, uh, our motivational fuel. And the Brain Joe method of instruction and the courses that utilize it are also designed um, to help keep you progressing and maintaining your motivation. But in this episode, I'm going to be sharing six tips for dealing with these particular issues or six tips for how to practice more. And three of these are going to be involving how to make more time for banjo. And three of these are, are about how to maintain motivation. These are all things that I do myself and have found to be enormously helpful over the years. Had I known them from the beginning, I would have shortcutted my own uh, time process by a good bit. These are all things that I do myself and have found to be enormously helpful. And as you'll see, um, broadly speaking, um, these tips mainly center around removing obstacles that stand in the way of you playing more. All right, so with that in mind, let's get to the first tip. Remember, the first three are going to center around uh, making more time or how to, how to deal with uh, a perceived lack of time. The first thing to do is make sure your instrument is easily accessible. So long ago when I bought my first banjo, I'd put it back in its case after every time I played it. It was, it was a prized possession. I didn't want anything to happen to it, so I wanted to take really good care of it. Except ultimately, I realized that being in its case was an obstacle to playing more, um, to being you know tucked away somewhere. I had to get it out and so forth. So I decided to start trying to leave it on a stand instead and noticed that that had a significant uh, impact on the amount of time that I played. Um, the other thing that leaving your instrument does, in addition to removing the, the friction or the time it takes to take it out of its case, is it serves as a visual cue as well. One of the things we all contend with these days more than ever before is the assault on our attention. So most of us uh, carry a device in our pockets everywhere that contains multiple uh, apps that have been explicitly designed by extremely smart people to use every psychological trick in the book to keep our eyeballs glued to, the, to it for as long as possible to sell lots and lots of advertising. Um, and not to mention the endless amount of videos and music and other great media that we now have uh, at the click of a button. So... We have to use some of those same psychological tools and tricks to our own advantage uh, so that we actually end up spending our time and attention on the things we care about rather than being forever at the mercy of the algorithms and our whims. And so just seeing the banjo out of the corner of your eye is enough to spark a desire to play it. And as you can see from the studio that I'm in, um, I no longer keep any instruments in their cases uh, because I want easy access to all of them. And I've developed my own personal rule, which is that if I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving an instrument out uh, with the off chance that it's, it would uh, fall and break, then it's too expensive. Now, I will say that after uh, well over a decade of having instruments always out, knock on wood, <laughs> I've yet to have one uh, break. So that's the first tip, make it easy to access. The second is to consider the weight of your instrument. 
with banjos in particular, there's a huge variation in how much they weigh. Um, some upwards of 13, 14 pounds uh, with your, when you're talking about the steel tone rung bluegrass banjo style uh, banjos. Um, as you may know, uh, years ago, I partnered up with Tim Gardner of Cedar Mountain, ba- Cedar Mountain Banjos to create the Brainjo banjo model. The goal there was to create the what I thought of as kind of the ultimate player's instrument. And it ended up only being four pounds in weight. And ironically, we actually hadn't discussed the weight part when creating the, uh, the prototype. Um, but this has been huge for me. Uh, and it wasn't until I had a banjo this light that I realized how much a difference the weight made in terms of how likely I was to just grab it and start playing, as well as how long I felt like playing it. So it has been my primary banjo ever since, um, partly because I love the sound, but also partly because it's so light and easy to grab. And because of that experience, I also changed the bluegrass uh, resonator banjo that I play primarily from your kind of typical one with a a steel tone ring that was heavy to uh, the Cedar Mountain Bramble Bramble model, which has a wooden tone ring and is about five or six uh, pounds lighter than the kind of the typical uh, model, um, which again makes a huge difference uh, in addition to also giving a wider range of uh, tonal possibilities that I really like. So for that, it's been a win-win. So if you've ever felt like your instrument was on the heavy side, um, then consider test driving a lighter banjo and see how that feels. And I included this particular tip because I was personally surprised at just how much of a difference um, this the weight of the banjo made for me. All right, the third tip is to keep all of your practice materials and resources in one spot and leave them there. In other words, have a dedicated uh, practice area or practice station and make sure that it has all the things you might need when you practice so that you're not having to hunt around for stuff to just to get ready uh, to to practice um, or sit down and find you don't have what you need. So that includes things like your tuner, your strings, um, any instructional resources, uh, any timekeeping devices, whether that's a metronome or a computer with speakers or an uh, uh, iPhone connected to uh, a speaker, uh, along with your instruments, uh, easily accessible. Again, you want to spend the least amount of time having to gather things up uh, before you get started. And additionally, if you don't have some sort of timekeeping device accessible when you practice, um, then you're a lot less likely to use it. And as I've said many times before, you don't want to make that mistake. You want to make sure you're always practicing with that. And so at a, as a, at a minimum, make sure that that's easily accessible wherever your typical practice area is. All right, so those are the first three tips that kind of deal with um, the limited time aspect of uh, as an obstacle to practicing more. And the fourth tip, now we're getting into the motivational territory, um, which is most applicable if you feel your motivation running low, is to commit to the smallest amount of time that you think you can do consistently. So you might be walking around thinking that in order to have a meaningful uh, practice, you've got to commit maybe at least 45 minutes or so. And if for whatever reason that feels like a lot, then you'll probably avoid it. On the other hand, if you commit to practicing, say, five minutes a day, uh, whatever you feel like doesn't seem like a lot, that's going to feel way easier and you're going to be much more likely to do it. And as I've talked about before, the bulk of our improvements uh, from the standpoint of the brain are achieved in that initial part of practice, meaning those first five minutes are giving you the most bang for your buck of any time uh, compared to anything else. And practicing consistently and regularly is so much more important than how long you practice or the duration of your practices. Um, also, there's a good chance that if you commit to doing five minutes, that you'll actually end up doing much more. Oftentimes, the inertia of getting started is the biggest challenge to overcome. And then once you get in the flow of things, you may end up doing much uh, more uh, than you thought you would. Um, By the way, this is also a great tactic if you are trying to exercise more, whether it's walking or running or working out with weights. Just commit to the smallest amount you think you can do consistently and start there. The fifth tip is to make sure that you have learning material that is accessible to you. So in a recent uh, episode, I talked about one of the criteria of deciding what song to learn next uh, being something that you think you can learn in a week or less. 
And that's because choosing material that is too far beyond your current skill level is almost guaranteed to result in frustration. You want your uh, learning material to be in that zone of desirable difficulty, uh, giving you just enough challenge that it stimulates growth and improvement, uh, but isn't so far uh, beyond your current skill set to be out of reach or nearly impossible to play or impossible to play well, uh, meaning cleanly and with good timing and tone and allowing you to focus on all of those important um, nuances of uh, good good uh, banjo playing. All right, so... That is tip number five. The final number six is to make it a habit. So the ideal deal scenario here is one where you have a dedicated time for playing and practicing that's baked into your daily routine that you do automatically without even thinking about it. So I talk a lot about this principle of habits and automaticity with respect to the technical aspects of playing and developing all automaticity for all of the movements of our hands that are needed to play our instrument. But this principle extends all the way up to our most complex behaviors. We can make anything, any behavior habitual and automatic if we perform it consistently. And the reason that habits are so powerful is because once you've formed them, you'll find it harder not to do that thing than you will find it to do it. Again, exactly like once you've learned a song the wrong way or learned a mistake and it's become a habit, it's far easier to play that mistake than it is to play without it. So when practicing regularly isn't a habit, it will take some degree of effort to do it each day. But when it is a habit, it will take some degree of effort to not do it each day. Now, anything that you do consistently and regularly, day in and day out, will turn into a habit. And the amount of time it takes, uh, based on the research, varies somewhat depending on the activity. But generally speaking, the average time it takes for something to truly become a habit is about two months, again, performed uh, consistently and regularly. So if this is feasible, then set a dedicated time each day when you're going to practice. And the more specific you can be about it, the better. So write out each day at this time for this number of minutes, I'm going to practice. Again, commit to the smallest amount that you think is doable. And one way that you can make this process of habit formation a little bit easier is to link your habit to one that already exists or stack it on top of another one. So the best example of a habit stack that you probably already have is your morning routine. So chances are there's a set list of things that you do each and every morning in the same way, in the same order. You've likely been doing it for many years. And you can think of each of those behaviors as links on a chain. And so one thing you can do is link a new habit you're trying to form to an existing chain of habits. Um, So if you wanted to link practicing to your morning routine, then you take the last thing that you do as part of that routine and to become the cue for doing that uh, new behavior that you want to become a new habit. So for example, if putting your clothes on is the last part of your morning routine, then that becomes your cue to then go practice for five minutes, 10 10 minutes, whatever you've set aside. Every habit has some sort of cue that initiates it or starts the process in motion, Um, something that happens that triggers the brain to start that particular um, program. So the advantage of linking a new habit to an existing one is you know that cue is going to be there each and every day. And so that's going to serve as a consistent reminder for you to practice uh, or to perform whatever new habit it is uh, until it has become established and automatic. Okay, so a quick recap of the six things that we can do to play more banjo or play more music or really do more of anything we want to do more of but might otherwise be derailed by our whims or the ever-rising sea of distractions vying for our attention. So the first is make your instrument easy to access. Second, consider a lighter instrument if weight has ever been an issue or an impediment. Third, have a practice uh, station with all of your practice materials and resources in one spot. Number four, commit to the smallest amount of time that you think you can do consistently. Number five, um, make sure you have accessible material to work on, meaning that's appropriate for your skill level that provides just enough uh, challenge, but not too much. And tip number six is turn practicing into a habit so that it becomes automatic. As I said earlier, this is really about structuring our environment in a way that helps ensure we spend more of our time doing the things that we want to be doing, spending our attention on the things that we choose rather than the things that others choose for us. 
Um, and again, that is more of an issue today than it has been in any time in human history, and it is not going anywhere. So hopefully these tips will help you to find more time for banjo or whatever other passions you have that you'd like to be spending more of your time on. That's all for this Brain Joe Bite. Thank you for watching or listening, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching this episode of Brain Joe Bite. To catch future episodes, hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell if you haven't done so already. You can also hear these episodes on the Brain Joe Jam podcast, and you'll find a link to that in the video description. Also, if you are ready to get started learning the banjo, then head over to brainjo.academy. There you will find courses based on the Brain Joe method. The first neuroscience-based system of instruction designed specifically for grown-up brains with no prior musical experience required. Thank you.